It's Monday, and it's time for a new episode of the Joust About Careers podcast. I'm your host, Brian Brock, and I'm a career advisor and English teacher at Van Buren High School who has seen too many people spend a lot of money and time working toward careers they don't enjoy or that don't help them achieve the purposes they've identified for their lives. I want to make sure that doesn't happen to anyone else, whether it's a high schooler or someone approaching retirement. My guest today is Nicholas DeBoober, an Associate Scientist of Structural Biology at UCB, a multinational biopharmaceutical company. Nicholas will be sharing about what he does as a scientist focused on crystallography, how he turned a co-op into a full-time job, what his career has taught him about failure, and much more. I hope that what Nicholas shares today will help you make better career decisions and lead to a fulfilling career journey. Welcome back to the Joust About Careers podcast. And today we are lucky to have with us Nick DeBoover. He is a 2009 Van Buren High School graduate, and he currently works as an associate scientist of structural biology for UCB out in Washington State in Seattle. So he is going to be talking to us a little bit about his career path and how he ended up all the way across the country from Van Buren and what he does as a scientist. So, Nick, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks and for having me. I'd love to hear a little bit about what do you actually do as an associate scientist? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, I work at a pharmaceutical company called UCB, and uh, I work in their structural de- uh, biology department, and within structural biology, there's a there's like a within that container. There's a something called crystallography, which is uh, the area that I specialize in. Um, and additionally, I have a lot of interest and passion in developing computational and data science tools, like mach- using machine learning and artificial intelligence to kind of aid in the process that leads to creating crystals that we use um, to study the protein matter that we're uh, interested in looking at. And I also uh, work as a collaborator with a consortium called the Seattle Structural Genomics Center for Infectious Disease. And uh, the purpose of that uh, consortium is to generate models of uh, high interest proteins that are associated with organisms that are known to cause uh, Uh, different sorts of infections, um, like uh, fungal infections, bacterial infections, viral infections. And so the one most uh, on the top of everyone's mind these days is coronavirus, which is uh, something that we as a group have worked on. Interesting. So a lot of high-level science going (laughs) on uh, with these proteins and so forth. Now, when you what's a typical day look like for you are you in a lab most of the time are you meet in meetings most of the time is it a mix are there a bunch of other things that are going on yeah uh in general it's a mix um currently i i only really i only go into the office um maybe three days a week um and that's because there is lab work to do and um, yeah, it just depends on the week. Some weeks I might spend like 80% of my time in the lab. Some weeks it might only be 20. It just depends on um, what our priorities are and what we're working on at the moment. Um, a lot of the time I'm working on computational work, which um, wouldn't require me to be in a lab. And there are a lot of meetings. <laughs> 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 like I, I was in a uh, a meeting for an hour and a half this morning, uh, right before this. So when you were in high school, did you love science classes? Were you in a lot of science classes? Did you excel in science classes? Or is this something that you discovered more after high school? What, I guess, give us an insight into high school, Nick, and what are some things that happened in high school that maybe helped move you in the direction where you've ended up? Yeah, I uh, I can't say that I was particularly super interested in science. It was just a subject 
uh, in the classes, like, I just found them easy, and I didn't really put a lot of thought into science as a career long term. Initially, I thought I was going to do computer engineering. Um, and I started going to school uh, initially studying computer science and engineering. Um, so no, I really wasn't thinking about science in high school. <laughs> okay. okay. So what then made that change to lead you to move from computers to science? Was it a class? Was it meeting someone? What led to that? Yeah, uh, it was a little bit of an odd uh, path that I took. So um, after my sophomore year of college, I was offered a co-op opportunity over the summer uh, working for a, a consulting company. Um, and uh, after, at the end of that co-op, they offered me a full-time job. And so I decided to leave school full-time and uh, do that <laughs> instead. And I, I still took like one or two classes a semester, but at that point, uh, I already had the job. And so it was just like, eventually I'll complete my degree. Um, and working there, uh, because it was consulting, I, I got to work with a lot of different clients that worked in a lot of different sectors, everything from banking to education to manufacturing to pharmaceutical sciences, et cetera. Like a lot of different, a lot of exposure to a lot of fields. And I felt I was the most excited when I worked with uh, clients that were in uh, the field of chemistry or biochemistry. Um, and so when I eventually decided, hey, I should probably finish my college degree, I, <laughs> I, uh, when I, I went back full time, and I'm like, well, I already have all this like computer science knowledge. Like, what's the point of getting a degree in that? So I was like, OK, we'll do biochemistry. And so I spent two years uh, do, finishing that degree. So was it unusual for them to offer a co-op, a full-time job before in your case, he had a degree, or is that something that's typical, or? Uh, it is not typical. <laughs> uh, I think I got very lucky with that. Um, definitely not something anyone should ever count on. I think most often co-ops or internships lead to uh, job offers post-graduation, um, not before. Um, yeah, it just worked out for me. I was going to say, I had to make you feel good that they obviously saw value in what you were doing for them, that they wanted to get you before they, uh, before you were going to go back to college. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's, that's, They're like, uh, how, how much do we need to pay you to not leave? I was like, wow. cool. <laughs> it was a weird place to be in because uh, I was only 20 at the time. So I was like, what? <laughs> right, right, right. So you eventually go to the University of Toledo. And like you said, earned your degree there. And yeah. then you started working your way up the, the, the ladder with um, your science careers. So a research associate in immunity bio, and then starting work at UCB as an associate scientist. And then, I'm sorry, started as research associate, went to a senior research associate, associate scientist, and now um, yeah, you're the associate scientist there in structural biology. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that climbing up the ladder and how the time at Immunity Bio led to UCB and how did yeah, all that sure. work? Uh, do you want me to go back to everything post-graduation? Sure, or? sure. Okay. So um, uh, they always talk about, like, it's about who you know. And... Uh, <laughs> It's a little bit of a cliche, but it's also kind of true. Uh, so when I was in, uh, when I was finish doing my, finishing up my undergrad, I I did undergraduate research, um, and um, when I was applying for jobs uh, for after graduation, one of the companies that I applied to, the CEO was pretty good friends with the person I was doing undergraduate research with, and that led to. Uh, uh, a job at a company called Anatrace, and um, where they make uh, crystallography-related reagents. And um, from there, I was able to 
secure a job back at the university um, doing crystallography research full time. And having that association with Anna Trace uh, definitely helped secure that, along with having some computer science uh, background. So knowing how to script, write code, process data, et cetera, it, it all kind of tied in there. Right. And then after I finished at the, so uh, that job was kind of cool because uh, we were we were paid a research grant uh, through NASA to work on uh, the effects of microgravity on how, um, like how microgravity affects uh, uh, how protein crystallizes. So it was really cool getting to work with that and send experiments to the space station and stuff. Oh, wow. So that really made me stick out when I was applying to jobs when that grant was ending, uh, which landed me in Seattle at Immunity Bio for a little bit. Um, and there I was just uh, doing some process development work uh, with preclinical, um, at the preclinical stage for, um, they were making vaccines to target a, like uh, different uh, disease indications. Um, and then after a year, I was kind of getting bored and I saw a job opening in a crystallography lab uh, here in Seattle. And so I was like, oh, I might as well apply. And there, um, working for Anatrace, they're like, oh, hey, you work for Anatrace. Do you know this person, this person? I was like, yeah, I know those people. And also, one of the people I interviewed with, um, when they were doing their PhD, um, my undergraduate research advisor was taking a sabbatical in that lab to learn structural biology. So there was, uh, when I had, uh, him as one of my references, it, it was like, oh, hey, I know that guy and I trust his opinion on people. So like it is, it's important to build those relationships when you are in college because you're going to probably rely on those letters of reference for a long time. So um, don't be another face in the crowd. <laughs> right, right, right. Those relationships are definitely important. And, and I like, I, I didn't mention earlier, we were talking about when you were in the IT position and you were working with all those different groups of people and you found you really were interested in the people that were working with chemistry and science and so forth. Just yeah. that exposure to opportunity and you then took those exposures and started to mold what your career path was going to look like, which I think mm -hmm. is, is awesome. Now, with all of this, it seems like you are a doer. You, you <laughs> see opportunity and you go do something with it. Yeah, I get and told no a lot. So <laughs> what's that? I get told no a lot. So. Oh. <laughs> well, but uh, again, that means that you're asking at least you're trying to to make those advancements. And yeah. you know, one thing that I I saw is that you know you're a published author and, and you've contributed to various articles. Uh, Nature among those. Uh, talk a little bit about, was that scary to uh, be writing for such a well-known publication? Uh, is it difficult to get published? What does it take to do that? Yeah, I would say difficulty it just kind of depends on where you're trying to publish. And uh, yeah, it, it just depends on where you're trying to publish. There's There, there are like lower tiered journals that are they're less stringent and picky about the material that's being presented. And yeah, it just depends on where you're trying to go. With with nature, I kind of had the benefit of uh, the the um, primary investigator on in that research is a very well-known, very popular uh, person who does work with like uh, uh, protein design. And just having his name on the paper, I think, made it easier in that case uh, to publish. Um, in terms of nerves, I really didn't know it was being published into Nature until I got an email asking for me to like proofread it. So <laughs> um, that was a big bit of a surprise. So you talk briefly about having people say no to you a lot. <laughs> Uh, how do you deal with that rejection? Can you maybe share some ideas you've had where you've been turned down? 
Uh, and did that make the successes that much sweeter or, or does it still hurt to be told no? Uh, I don't know. I think in research in particular, you kind of get conditioned to be okay, first of all, with failure, because you have to try a lot of things. And most, almost 90 to 99% of the things you try are not going to succeed. And so you kind of get conditioned to failure. And I think you kind of have to do the same thing with being okay with maybe asking a question you might perceive as being a little bit I don't know, dumb. <laughs> um, there, there's definitely no such thing as a dumb question because it could be a basis for a good idea. And um, sometimes it might be a little too outlandish because um, like in the position I have now, we kind of have to think about reproducibility and scalability of a lot of things we do. And so sometimes I might come up with an idea that might work, but not something that would be easily scalable. And in those cases, I generally get told, you know, the big N-O. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that interest, that condition to failure. And, you know, again, I think a lot of times high school students, failure is the last thing they want because that means they, you know, bad grades or whatever. But in your realm, Failure is, hey, I tried something, I learned from that not working or being yeah. rejected. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's an interesting difference between your mindset and a lot of times what we see in schools. You learn a lot from your failures, I think. So I think, yeah, I think especially when I was younger, I feel like I was less open to uh, being exposed in a way that felt like I was failing at something, but at this point, I'm just like, oh, yeah, it didn't work, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you went back to the University of Maryland to earn your master's degree. I did. And, you know, we've talked about how as students, you need to determine what, what uh, degrees do you need, what licenses, certifications, et cetera. Why was the time that you went back to your master's, why was that the right time for you to do something <laughs> like that? Uh, I was bored. Uh, I think with the, like I, th I think a lot of people can kind of uh, relate to this, but like uh, with you know the coronavirus and the pandemic and stuff being you know not able to do a lot of the things you might have been used to or accustomed to doing, it left a lot of void in time. <laughs> and I don't do well with uh, just sitting idly and uh, not doing much. And so I was like, well, there's a lot of online programs, so let me see if I can apply somewhere and start going to school. And yeah, just worked out. And while it's not directly related with a lot of the things that I do, it is tangentially related. And I do pull a lot of things from the education into my work now. So it's, it's just one thing that kind of worked out. <laughs> right, right. And now you have a broader range of understanding and uh, who knows what doors that might open going forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if someone wanted to become a scientist, you know, work in a lab, and I realize there's a million different types of scientists, but <laughs> yeah, is, is there, are there any things that people, that students could be doing while in high school to start setting themselves up for that potential career path? I think one thing that's kind of important to do, um, and honestly, I wish I would have done a better job of this, um, is like when you're like taking classes in high school, they might not be super in depth uh, about like particular subject areas, but it does give you a good idea of like the kind of things that are out there and just being very mindful and uh, intentional about the things that you're learning about and reading about and paying attention to what excites you and what doesn't because you might have it in your head that oh man someday I want to do this but you weren't paying attention to how that actually affected you when you were learning it and it might not quite turn out the way that you were hoping but even if you get into college and that happens, like it is 100% okay to change degrees. Most people do at some point. Right. It, it's just being um, 
open to the possibility of things not going the way that you planned. So, right. Right. which is like you said, typically going to happen. It r very rarely goes as planned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So living in Seattle, Washington, what's the bi biggest difference between living there and living in Northwest Ohio? Uh, tons of mountains, tons of water, lots of trees, green. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the, like weather-wise, uh, you hear about rain and it being rainy in Seattle. And that's partially true for like nine months of the year, but it's not a downpour. It's just like a light sprinkle cloudy nine nine months and then there's like three months during the summer where it's perfect <laughs> like in the morning it's like high 50s low 60s gets to a high around 75 or so and then cools down again but it's sunny every day and it's fantastic that does sound nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah so as you look back at yourself in high school what do you know now about careers that you wish you had known back when you were a student? You can say a million things, but I don't think it ever translates. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like even if it was like if I had if I was given better information or different information, I don't know if I would have paid attention any better. But that's just part of being young and restless and <laughs> having short attention spans so right, right um yeah maybe just uh having a good broad exposure in terms of like having uh conversations like this that just lets you know what's out there i think that's the best you can really do definitely an interesting career that you have something that i think a lot of students aren't aware of this as a possibility <laughs> yeah. so i really appreciate you sharing with this or with us about your career and i hope that maybe some students will reach out to you and ask more questions because like you've said anything that can expose them to various careers is going to be useful to them so thank you very much nick i greatly appreciate it and good luck as you continue on your career journey yeah thank you for having me Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of the Joust About Careers podcast. I hope you learned valuable information from this career story. And to be sure you don't miss upcoming episodes, please click subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform so you'll know when the next episode is released. Thank you for watching. And as always, this is the place to go to learn just about careers.